All right, here we go. Um, it is time. And this is a uh, fairly short time period for weak fish. My name is Rob O'Reilly. I'm with the Virginia Marine Resources Commission, and I'm the board chair. Also, Mike Schmidtke is up here with me. Mike is the ASMFC plan coordinator for Weak Fish, and Katie Drew is here as well with ASMFC, um, and I'm just gonna label her as a stock assessment extraordinaire person, okay? So, a couple things to do. We have to approve the agenda. Does everyone have the agenda in front of you? Do you have any changes, any comments on the agenda? Seeing none, the agenda is approved. We'll next turn to the proceedings from the last time the Weak Fish Management Board met, which was May of 2016. That was a little while ago. Um, any comments or changes on those proceedings? What I would encourage you, if you haven't had the time to read those proceedings all the way through, is they are sort of a uh, benchmark approach for where we're going to go forward. Uh, you have Jeff Brust, uh, you have him going over the stock assessment, um, and in addition, you've got the peer review that is talked about in here, and although it's been since May of 2016, this will be part of what we go forward with, with weak fish. I think you're going to see as we go forward that it's not going to be such a lull in activity for weak fish as you'll see a little bit later in the agenda. And so we thank Pat Campfield for going over the peer review in here. Um, and I think these are really, really a good document. Uh, next, we're going to have public comment. I don't have anyone who signed up, I don't think. But if there's anyone who would like to have a public comment at this time, um, please come forward. Seeing none, I'm going to turn to Mike Schmidtke. He's going to uh, provide information on the 2017 plan review and state compliance reports. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So today we'll be going over the, uh, the 2017 FMP review for weak fish. Uh, first, we'll start off looking at the, uh, at the landing status. This graph shows recreational harvest in black and commercial harvest in gray. Total coastwide coast landings in, uh, in 2016 were 247,000 pounds, which is a 19,000 pound decrease from 2015. The commercial fishery at 171,000 pounds accounted for about 70% of the total 2016 landings. Um, and increased by about 33,000 pounds from 2015. North Carolina at 47% and Virginia at 23% landed the largest share of the 2016 commercial landings. Here we see recreational harvest in blue and releases in red. Um, as you can see the, uh, in the mid 1990s, oh, and I apologize for that axis. Um, uh, as you can see in the mid-1990s, when Amendments 1 through 3 were implemented, releases have typically been about double the number of fish harvested. Uh, although with declining harvests in recent years, releases have outnumbered recreational landings about tenfold or more. In 2016, recreational landings were 76,000 pounds or 66,000 fish. This represents a 38% decline in poundage and 39% decline in numbers from 2015. North Carolina had the largest portion of recreational harvest at 51% by numbers and 46% by weight, followed by Virginia. An estimated 975,000 weak fish were released by the recreational fishery, which was a 12% decrease in number of releases, but a 3% increase in percentage of the recreational catch that was released. Addendum 1 to Amendment 4 requires the collection of otoliths and lengths to characterize the fishery. The number of samples required is based on the magnitude of each state's fisheries, so that six fish lengths are collected for each metric ton of weak fish landed commercially, and three fish ages are collected for each metric ton of total weak fish landed. 
all states met the biological sampling requirements in 2016 except for Rhode Island and New York. Rhode Island specifically mentioned in their compliance report that they had difficulty attaining weak fish samples in 2016. They collected an adequate number of lengths but collected six ages less than their required nine. New York collected an adequate number of ages but five lengths less than their required 66. Uh, issues in sample collection have not been uncommon recently due at least in some part to the declining landings in this fishery. The plan review team recommends uh, that there's no reason to believe that a good faith effort to fulfill these requirements uh, was not put forth by these states. So uh, given the small margin by which they were short of their requirements, so the plan review team would recommend that the board still find them within compliance of these requirements. Uh, there is some ambiguity in the language of Addendum 1 in regards to sample source. Uh, so the plan review team recommends that the board provide guidance on whether states should be allowed to supplement current sample collections to fulfill their sample requirements um, with fishery independent samples. And we'll get into that um, really in the next agenda item. Um, due to recent difficulties in acquiring these samples, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, we'll just touch on that in the next agenda item. Oh, uh, not, not quite yet. That's fine. Oh, okay. In 2010, uh, the, the, in 2010, the recreational and commercial management measures in Addendum 4 replaced those in Addendum 2. However, um, the plan review team continues to evaluate the, uh, the former management triggers uh, as they provide some perspective on the landings. Um, the PRT does maintain its recommendation that the board update these triggers to be reflective of the most recent stock assessment. Uh, but looking at the, at the triggers as they stand right now, um, the commercial management measures are to be reevaluated if coastwide commercial landings exceed 80% of the mean landings from 2000 through 2004 or 3 million pounds. This trigger was not met, uh, but commercial and recreational management measures are to be reevaluated if any single state's landings exceed its five-year maximum by more than 25% in any single year. This did occur for Connecticut and Delaware, and we can discuss whether, or the board can discuss whether this is cause for management action. Um, the five-year mean includes 2015, which was the second lowest year for Delaware and the fifth lowest year for Connecticut in terms of total landing since 1981. So there, there is um, some of that to be accounted for uh, within this trigger and how high this high year supposedly is. Here's a, a review of kind of the, uh, the, all the different stages of uh, management. Right now we're currently under Amendment 4 uh, with associated addenda. Uh, the most recent stock assessment was in 2016 and uh, Rob alluded to that um, in previous comments. Uh, the stock is currently depleted. Um, but overfishing is not occurring. Uh, fishing mortality is stable and modest with a uh, high amount of natural mortality. Um, from 2011 to 2014, uh, there was a low level of total mortality and this corresponded to a small increase in spawning stock biomass. Uh, as of right now, the next assessment is in 2019, which is an assessment update. Um, the plan review team found that all states are in compliance with Amendment 4 and, and the associated addenda. Uh, de minimis was requested by Florida, Georgia, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. All of these states, except for Connecticut, qualify for de minimis. Uh, Connecticut's landings are 1.46% of the coastwide total, and to qualify for de minimis, you would need to be 1% or lower. Um, we spoke with uh, a representative from Connecticut and discussed within the plan review team that um, because of the small percentage that Connecticut would be over, uh, that the PRT doesn't uh, see any issue with allowing Connecticut to maintain de minimis status. Um, if they would have difficulty in fulfilling the biological sampling requirements, should they be uh, non-de minimis. 
So in summary, the PRT recommends the board approve the 2017 Weak Fish FMP review, state compliance reports, and de minimis status for Florida, Georgia, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. Additionally, the PRT recommends that the board clarify the use of fishery independent samples in fulfilling biological sampling requirements of Addendum 1 to Amendment 4. Um, and at, that, at this point, I can pause and take any questions on the, uh, the FMP review. Any questions for Mike? Yes. Chris Pat Savage. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mike, on page four of the, uh, the FMP review under the recreational fishery section, um, it's listed uh, the, the mean weights of weak fish in the recreational fishery by state. And the bottom of the, it's a, kind of the next to last paragraph before going into the next section. Um, for uh, on that page, it looks like for the state of New York for mean weight, it, it's 0.17. And I was wondering if that was a, a, a typo, um, considering that's a, a pretty small average weight uh, in size fish. Thanks. We're checking. Can you say the page number again, Chris, that you were looking at? Uh, yeah, it's uh, page, uh, page four, and um, it's in the recreational fishery section. It's uh, two paragraphs above or uh, ahead of uh, section four, which is status of assessment advice. So just, just above that, that's section four, you'll see the, the next to last, or the, the paragraph, I guess, second to last paragraph. I can, um, I, I'd have to double, double check, check the data file for that. Okay. I can look okay. into that. All right. Thank you, Chris. Uh, anyone else have a question? Mark, Alexandra. Not a question, but a comment. That's okay. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to thank the PRT for uh, acknowledging that it's appropriate to extend Connecticut uh, de minimis status, even though our, our total landings exceeded the threshold for being considered de minimis. I think in this case, uh, I, don't, I don't know if the PRT looked into this, but I had staff examine our uh, recreational harvest estimate uh, for 2016 to see uh, why it was so large. In table four on page 15, if you look at that, Connecticut uh, since 2004 has either had a zero harvest estimate or no harvest estimate uh, between 2004 and 2016, uh, uh, 15. In 2016, the estimate was uh, 3,120 pounds. Uh, I had Greg Wojcik look into that to see um, to see you know, what went into that estimate, and it is based on two intercepts. One is aboard a party charter boat where one fish was caught. That was expanded to 88 fish. The other is a shore-based B1 observation in which the individual uh, identified the fillets in his cooler as being weak fish. He had caught three, which is admittedly over the limit, two over the limit, but that particular observation was expanded to 3,032 fish. Uh, so I, um, I, I just wanted to put that on the record. Uh, and, and, and again, I appreciate the, the P, PRT's recommendation that Connecticut be considered uh, de minimis. Thank you, Mark. Can you corroborate how long Connecticut has had de minimis status? Uh, no, I cannot. Roy Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mike, uh, and looking at the tables, like in Table 2, it's, it's obvious that commercial landings have been below 200,000 pounds, which I consider a trivial amount considering the history of this species uh, for the past three years. Um, does the plan review team know what those landings come from? Is it directed, is it directed landings or bycatch landings? Do you have any idea? 
Thanks. I believe most of the commercial landings are, are bycatch landings at this point because of the uh, because of the trip limit. Roy, if I could just follow that up, if indeed they're bycatch landings, um, or any of those fisheries, would any of those fisheries give us some inkling of what may be happening to these one plus weak fish? Um, the reason I bring this up is every year we seem to get a, a decent amount of juvenile production in Delaware Bay, and yet year after year after year, uh, very little of that comes back as a um, fishable resource, particularly for the recreational and commercial fisheries. Uh, so the big question that, that the public asks us is, well, what happens to these fish? And, uh, are there any indications from these bycatch fisheries that they may be having an impact on what comes back as a catchable resource later on in its life cycle? Thank you. Further questions or comments? Okay, to my left. Hello, Jay. Jay McNamee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so first I have uh, a quick question, and that is are we on bullet two yet, or am I jumping the gun on that? Uh, I think that's the next agenda item. Oh, wait then, thank you. Any further questions or comments? Otherwise, we're uh, John very, Clark. John Clark? Oh, I was just gonna say, Rob, are you ready for a motion to accept the plan review? Yes. In that case, I will move that we, oh, now it's off the board. Oh, there it is. That's the motion I want to make. I will do so. Move to accept the 2017 FMP review and state compliance reports for weak fish and approve de minimis, de minimis requests for Massachusetts, Connecticut, Georgia, and Florida. Emerson Hasbrook has a second. Any discussion on the motion? Okay. Any objection to the motion? Seeing none, the motion passes. And now we'll go to, back to Mike, and uh, consider the use of fishery independent samples. So over the past few years, um, there has been some difficulty, and it's not really specific to any one particular state. It's, uh, there are several states that have had uh, difficulties in fulfilling the biological sampling requirements of Addendum 1 to Amendment 4. Um, and so looking at the actual language that is in Addendum 1, uh, there are a couple places where it's there's questions about interpretation, at least from the PRT's perspective, that uh, that we would like some board clarification on as as we evaluate uh, the the samples that are uh, submitted each year to fulfill the requirements. Uh, the first portion um, in, from Addendum One includes the statement: the weak fish stock assessment requires bio biological data collected from samples of recreational and commercial catch as the motivator for these sampling requirements. Um, after listing out the uh, the non de minimis requirements within that section of wording, uh, there's the statement: samples may come from commercial and or recreation come from the commercial and or recreational fishery as long as they come from the same general area, inshore versus offshore, that those fisheries are prosecuted in. So there's no uh, statement within the addendum that that says fishery independent samples may not be used, but there is no statement that says overtly that they may be used. So we were just looking for some board clarification on that. Jay McNamee. <clears throat> thanks, um, thanks Mr. Chair. So I, I guess, and I'm not sure, maybe it's a question for Katie. Um, the where are the lengths and ages being used? I mean, are these samples supposed to give you the information for the selectivity part of the assessment for the fishery dependent information? And 
I guess if that's your nodding. So, I, you know, I take that as affirmative, and then it gets, I don't know how valuable fishery independent information would be, then maybe it's better than nothing, but I guess I'm not sure that that's true. And then the other aspect of it is I'm thinking about in Rhode Island, um, I think it was Roy who mentioned it before, we get tons of young of the year, so we could fill the requirement in spades, but I don't know how valuable that information would be to get lots of information on zeros and, and nothing on the rest of the age structure. So I guess um, those are kind of questions slash comments, and, and you can grab and take it wherever you want, I guess. Thank you. So I do have a couple comments. Uh, talked to Mike before the meeting and about this issue, and there have been problems with states for various reasons, um, whether it was budgetary, whether it was uh, being able to have people who would go out and get the samples. But ever since the uh, addendum went in place, it seemed like every year when weak fish was meeting more frequently, there were some states that couldn't make the targets. Um, and that's going to happen. That's going to continue to happen. So I've always been more interested in a regional approach, um, knowing very well from the past that you really can't swap out some of the northern samples for the southern samples and vice versa. I mean, there can be four different age groups um, on a certain size, depending on whether that fish is collected in the southern or northern area. So if you go to independent fish, independent samples, then what should the criteria be that you have for collection? And we have data from the states, even though they're not complete, um, if they didn't you know, do something in the year where they made the target, at least we know the size ranges that have been collected before. So you would want the independent samples to somewhat match what would have been collect collected from the dependent samples. And you would want the time of collection to somewhat match the time of the dependent fishery. That may be a starting point. I'd like to hear what others have to say about that. Of course, you get into situations where some of the independent samples, um, you know, for so there's going to be avoidance, for example, uh, for some of the larger weak fish, but we haven't been seeing a whole lot of large weak fish, so, you know, that may not be a problem now. That may be something down the road. So we need a starting point. And it would be good to get a little bit of feedback on this issue now um, because it's, it's going to be a problem that persists for various reasons. Katie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think that the TC was not asked officially to weigh in on this, so, so this isn't an official TC opinion. But I think the other thing to consider, um, certainly the point about um, fishery independent samplings having a different length distribution um, is, is a concern that the TC would have. So I think the, the length, we, wouldn't, we would accept um, ages from the fishery independent samples as long as they line up with roughly the, the size range that is covering the fishery as well. But I think we would have concerns about accepting lengths from the fishery independent survey in place of lengths for the, commer for the commercial or recreational issue. Uh, thank you, Katie. And I, I guess what I was thinking more was an augmentation, not a swapping. So we wouldn't want to see a state just say, well, no more fishery dependent sampling, we can get it this way. So I think one of the one of the criteria should be that we know what states have produced in recent years, even under a situation where the stock is not robust. So we would want that to continue and get augmentation through fishery independent. Would that be a better suggestion? Yeah, I think that would, however we word it, I think the and I'm sure states, I'm not saying states are going to take this to slack off immediately on all of their commercial and recreational sampling if we, if we allow this. But I think for sure the emphasis should be on sort of supplementing existing commercial and recreational sampling programs rather than replacing it purely with fishery independent data. And the lengths, again, are not, the fishery independent lengths are not really useful to characterize the commercial and recreational size, but the ages could be. Last question for you, if I may, and then we'll have some other others too, but um, is this something that can be talked about the technical committee, come up with some criteria, uh, you know, a straw man essentially of this? 
Uh, for sure, if you would like sort of formal guidance on, or on what would be an acceptable supplementation, I think the TC could come up with that easily. Thank you. Emerson, Emerson Hasbrick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in, in order to make some comment on, on um, um, samples coming from um, uh, or not coming from the fishery, I want to circle back to the issue that Jason raised. Um, so I'm going to ask a direct question because I didn't hear it answered. So is, is, the, is the model that we use for the weak fish assessment the ASAP model? And are these samples being used to determine catch at age? So, yeah, well, yes, it is a it is a statistical catch at age model. It's not ASAP. We actually have a very fancy uh, Bayesian model that can estimate natural mortality in addition to fishing mortality, um, but it does use a catch at age framework. So the length frequency from the commercial and from the recreational um, landings is really what we use to determine that catch at age, and we do that by applying an age length key. So the length frequency needs to represent the length of what is actually caught, but then to convert that into ages, we can we use a key that, has, that often comes from fishery independent as well as fishery dependent age samples, which is why we would say that it's more important to maintain the length information from the commercial and recreational side, the ages, as long as they sort of cover that same length range and that you're not getting an age length key that's entirely young of year, as long as that age length key has samples that can cover the length range of the commercial and recreational side, then it doesn't matter where those age samples come from. Emerson. Thank you. Yes. Um, follow up then. Um, if, if that's the case, then I would have to agree that um, we really don't want to get length frequency samples from fishery independent surveys. Is, is that an absolute? I just need to know. I just spent a little bit of time talking about augmentation and sort of just plugging holes that were in the sampling. Um, so given Emerson's comment, what would you say? I would say lengths, yes, lengths from fishery independent samples are useful only to characterize the length distribution of that fishery independent sample. So certainly we would not want to completely give up our fishery independent lengths, but they have no utility, lengths alone have no utility for the commercial or recreational, to characterize the commercial or recreational catch. The ages, I think, is where you could supplement that information. So if you're taking, um, if you can only get age samples from your fishery independent survey, which may be the case because you have to sacrifice the fish or you have to damage the fish and you can't get that from the commercial or the recreational side, then you can certainly supplement the ages with fishery independent, again, as long as they're covering that, that similar size range, but you would not want to supplement the length frequency of the commercial or recreational catch with fishery independent information. Okay, thank you. It took me three times, but uh, I give. And... Uh, so everyone should know that, you know, we may continue to have these sampling gaps a little bit, but the scientific advice is stick to the ages from the independent, uh, you know, surveys, not the lengths, and continue to try your best to do some sampling. Um, and there's a lot of demands. We understand that. The other part is, which, you know, I'll try and work on in, in advance of the next meeting on how we might regionalize some of the dependent sampling, um, you know, some nearest neighbor approaches, which has always been, you know, something that could have happened. So we'll talk about that next time we meet as well. So thank you very much. We're on time, except we did have an added issue. So uh, Chris Bat Savage has an issue. And what you're going to find after Chris is done is it's not an issue that's just occurring in North Carolina. But Chris is the one who brought this to the attention of ASMSC. And so, Chris, I'd like you to just sort of outline the situation um, and give some, some basics, and then we'll have a, a discussion. And this is something that's going to carry forward until the next meeting, absolutely. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
We've received reports of weak fish catches uh, substantially exceeding the 100 pound trip limit in the ocean gillnet fishery targeting Atlantic croaker uh, in 20 to 30 fathoms of water, roughly, plus or minus, uh, offshore of Oregon Inlet uh, for the second year in a row, and it may have been going on for a little longer than that. Uh, the discard amounts that have been reported to us by fishermen are you know, when, they're, when the fish are there in the 500 to 1,000 pound range. Uh, but these uh, discard events are, are pretty sporadic. Uh, there's times when the fishermen will go out targeting croaker and will hardly see any weak fish at all. And then they'll go out in other times uh, and they'll, they'll encounter quite a few weak fish while, uh, while targeting uh, Atlantic croaker. Um, the, uh, the, the weak fish, uh, from talking to the fishermen, the weak fish are, are mixed in with the croaker. So it's not like simply you know, going one place and finding them all the time. And the uh, the fish, the weak fish they're encountering are in the uh, 14 to 16 inch range, um, and and that that size range is really corresponding to the mesh size uh, mesh sizes currently used uh, in the croaker fishery off of Oregon Inlet, which right now ranges in the three and a quarter to three and a half inch stretch mesh uh, range. Um, the uh, gillnet fishery for croaker off uh, Oregon Inlet uh, typically ranges from mid, no mid to late November um, to around mid to late March. Uh, from kind of looking back at uh, reports we've received from fishermen, it looks like the discards have been occurring in December and January for the most part, but again, it's been pretty sporadic. Um, we haven't heard of any other reports of increased weak fish discards in other fisheries, at least in our state, uh, but it's possible um, that it, it is occurring uh, elsewhere uh, along the, the coast, uh, especially if the population is starting to show uh, an, an increase uh, in abundance. Um, so uh, wanted to bring this to the board's attention and, and see if the board think, thinks it's appropriate to uh, task the uh, technical committee uh, to review any uh, available data on, on discards, uh, landings trends, and uh, gear characteristics of the fisheries that are uh, uh, in encountering uh, weak fish beyond the 100-pound trip limit. Uh, so that, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. I'll be happy to answer any questions. And uh, if whenever you think it's appropriate, Mr. Chairman, I have a motion uh, to, to offer. Thank you, Chris, and I do have some questions. Others may as well. Um, so I talked to one of your fishermen a couple of years ago when this started, and my understanding, you mentioned that it's out uh, 30 fathoms or so, or is that what you indicated? And essentially that was a move out compared to some of the more traditional fishing areas. Was that a change in fishing area at all? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, it, it is uh, the, uh, the the croaker fishery. You know, up until recently, was typically in, in much shallower water. So instead of you know measuring the water depth in fathoms, it was uh, more in the you know the 40 to 60 foot range, kind of straddling the uh, you know the the three mile boundary. Uh, and but it's recently moved out into to much deeper water. And uh, according to the reports from the uh, the fishermen, the weak fish have too. When we had a weak fish. Uh, targeted weak fish gillnet fishery uh, before the the, uh, the bycatch trip limit, the, that, that fishery also existed usually in, in uh, shallower water than what we're currently seeing. Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, I probably should have said your fisherman talked to me uh, because that's absolutely the way it happened. So when Chris brought this information forward and we started talking, um, checked around and the same situation is occurring in Virginia but much different in that it's uh, really only out to about a mile offshore and spring and fall definitely occurring. We looked at our data and there is a you know probably off the top of my head a third of the trips are a hundred pounds. So it tells us that if a hundred pounds exactly is being taken Yes, we've got discards. We followed up with a one of our main uh, fish buyers, and he indicated yes, there have been discards. The harvesters hadn't wanted to really make an issue of it, um, and they're not required to report the discards. They're required to report the harvest. So, all in all, this is a situation that involves more than North Carolina. I don't know about the other states, but I'm hoping when Chris puts up his motion 
that we all understand the technical committee should look at all the commercial states to see exactly what the performance of, is, of this bycatch time. Um, and we also do have a directed time period as well. It's not all during the year, but the bycatch is especially important time period. Um, any other questions for Chris? Okay, I think I saw uh, Lynn Fagley first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just my question for both Virginia um, and North Carolina, is this is this a gillnet specific issue or is this also happening in your trawl fisheries, if you have trawl fisheries? Chris? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we, we've only, we've received uh, specific uh, reports from the, the gillnet fishery. Um, we've, I've heard some uh, reports of, of trawl boats, uh, trawlers uh, encountering large amounts of weak fish, but uh, haven't really been able to uh, ver verify those and, and where, where those are occurring. Uh, the, the fishery for croaker off, uh, off of North Carolina has, has changed a bit over the years where it was both a, a trawl, it's still both a trawl and gillnet fishery with trawl landings uh, yeah, kind of leading the way, but uh, you know, due to various changes in the fishery and you know, shoaling of Oregon Inlet, uh, it's, it's largely a, a gillnet fishery. Trawls don't play as big a role uh, currently. In Virginia, Lynn, it's primarily gillnet, but it's also occurring in the pound net. We don't have a trawl fishery in state waters, but it is occurring in the pound net. Um, and on one hand, that's a good sign that we're seeing fish, but on the other hand, we need to really look at this. So thank you. Um, John Clark, did you have your hand up? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Chris, I just wonder if you could give a few more details. I know you said they were discarding typically 500 to 1,000 pounds a trip. Do you have an idea how many trips that is and approximately how far offshore are they setting these nets? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, not sure on the number of trips uh, from talking to the fishermen uh, who brought this up. Uh, it is, there are fewer boats in the, in the croaker gillnet fishery than there were 10 to 15 years ago. Um, as far as distance from shore, 20 to 30 fathoms, I can't remember off the top of my head, uh, but it's, it's definitely out in federal waters um, and with water, water depths uh, in, in that range. Uh, you know, weak, weak fish uh, typically you know, aren't, aren't in real good shape uh, when, when caught in, in, a, in a gillnet for several hours or an hour or so uh, and then brought it from those depths, they're, they're probably, we're most likely looking at 100% discard mortality. Any other questions? Chris? Is your motion available? Uh, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, so, so if you're ready, Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, I'd uh, like to move to task the technical committee to review weak fish <coughs> discard data from the Northeast Federal Observer Program and from vessel trip reports. Analyze landings data to see if the occurrences of commercial trips approaching the 100 pound trip limit have increased and to characterize the fisheries with substantial weak fish discards to see if different trip limits could be implemented to turn discards into landings and or if fishing modifications could be made to minimize discards. John Clark, second. I ask uh, the maker of the motion is the intention to look at when you say analyze landings data, are you including this, all the states? that have the commercial fishery? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, that, that's my intent, to look at states beyond just Virginia, North Carolina, where we've received reports about this. Uh, discussion on the motion? Jeff Brust. Jeff Brust. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chris, uh, I'm just wondering, is there any, I know North Carolina does have some observer programs. Is there any North Carolina specific or perhaps Virginia specific data that could also be used to look at this? Or I guess if this is for all states, is there any state observer data that could be used for this? Chris? We have uh, observer program data for our estuarine gillnet fisheries, um, and we, we took a quick look at it just internally. It doesn't look like there's much of a signal there, but that's certainly information we can provide 
to the technical committee to make sure that you know, you know, no, no stone goes unturned. Uh, the uh, since we don't have an observer program out in Ocean Waters, uh, out in Ocean Waters, North Carolina, we'd have to rely on uh, you know, the Federal Observer Program for any information uh, for the croaker fishery, for instance. Okay, I'm looking around. I don't see any other hands. Uh, would uh, ask if there's any objection to the motion. Does everyone understand that what we're trying to do here is there's been a definite lull in activities surrounding weak fish, but we do now have a peer-reviewed accepted stock assessment, and we also have a situation where at least it should be our responsibility to make sure that we now start to give weak fish a little more attention since it seems to be giving the fishermen a little bit more attention. So, you know, that's my take on what we're going to try and do. Um, Jay McNamee. Yep, no objection. Uh, just a, I guess I'm wondering, so we're looking for the technical committee here to make some comments on potential management programs and so Chris has offered different trip limits and so I'm wondering if implicit in that would be something like an aggregate uh, limit where they could accumulate over a week or something like that or are you looking for this is it kind of open or is it stick with the traditional approach of just add 50 pounds or or something to that effect so that's my question Chris um, yeah, th thanks, Jay. Um, yeah, I haven't really thought of it as far as whether to, you know, a daily trip limit or aggregate trip limit. Uh, yeah, I think I would leave, personally, I would leave that open for the technical committee to, to look at, you know, when, when they, uh, I guess, characterize the fisheries, you know, so, you know some are going to operate a little different than others along the coast. And, uh, yeah, I don't I think it's good to you know, identify what we want the TC to, to look at, but I don't want to uh, box them in too much. So I would, I, I think that would be fine to you know, explore a, any options uh, available that could potentially turn uh, discards into landings without you know, you know, increasing targeting per, you know, until we see a new assessment. Thank you, Chris. Robert Boyles. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Not to this, but just uh, doing it on the table, um, our state's efforts to look at the genetic, the stock structure makeup of weak fish. We've been um, certainly very interested in seeing if there's any stock differentiation, particularly in the South Atlantic. And uh, given that samples are very, very hard to come by, just encourage um, our sister states, particularly from the Mid-Atlantic, if, uh, if you've got some genetic samples, we're looking for them. Thank you. Robert, do you take fish? as such, samples as such, or are you looking for already sampled for genetics? Uh, we'd probably take fish uh, as such, but certainly if you've got genetic fin clips, we'd be interested in that as well. Thank you, and, and uh, for Jay, go ahead, and then I have a comment for you too. Yeah, maybe we're thinking the same thing. So I, <clears throat> I'm not inclined to monkey with the motion, and I'm hoping that the discourse that we had provides enough guidance to the technical committee. They can see it in, in the minutes. Thanks, Jay. And I, I guess the last couple of weeks, this has been a priority uh, in Virginia, and we started to pull data from different aspects, uh, whether aggregated or daily fishery season, directed bycatch. So we're starting to look at all that. Um, definitely, once we submit information collectively um, to the technical committee, then we would look for some type of direction that way too. So I, I think Chris has the right idea to start out. Once again, I'll say we have a motion on the board. Any objections to that motion since we've had some discussion and comments? I don't see any objections. Uh, the motion is approved. And if there's some other business, please let us know now. Any other business? Seeing none, we are adjourned. Thank you very much.